Okay, so we are recording. Henrietta, you're good Thanks, to go. Jeremy. Yeah, so hi everyone. Just a second from, uh, from me after Jeremy, just to say welcome. This is our last session with Roger Green and his Academy of Sacred Geometry. His guest tonight is Michael Rice, and they'll be talking about bioarchitecture. We're looking forward to this very much. Um, please do hop on the Q&A with uh, Mike and camera at the end. It would be great to have you join in, as Jeremy says, but ourselves. Um, I also just want to say that we always have a good uh, dialogue going on in the chat box, so please post and share your links, websites, any ideas, comments you have. It's really nice to get that going. It kind of down our news after the webinar is over. Roger's good at posting up relevant links and rest and pertinent to the topic. So anyway, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Roger, who will introduce Michael, and we'll see you at the end of the hour. Well, good evening, everybody from New York City. And as you know, this is our final instalment in our series. Uh, it's a uh, a kind of a wonderful honor in a way for me to have Michael with us. Uh, Michael and I go back uh, at least sort of something like 18 years or something like that. And uh, we've done lots of things together, uh, you know, conferences. Michael has attended pretty much most of the eco uh, bioarchitecture, feng shui, sacred geometry uh, conferences that I've put on uh, over the world. And uh, along with Dan Winter, you know, the whole theme of bioarchitecture was really put on the map with uh, Michael. Michael's done some beautiful practical work, practical designs with sacred geometry. I'm sure we're going to see some of that in, in his presentation tonight. Uh, uh, I've toured Ireland with Michael, uh, visiting um, uh, about a dozen of his beautiful house designs in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, these days, he's very active in uh, the Czech Republic. He does personal development workshops for, for men. And um, so, that look, uh, without further ado, let's um, say hello to Michael. Hello, Roger. Thank you. Hello to everyone. It's actually 19 years ago, Roger, and uh, uh -huh. I'll never forget because uh, you corrupted me. Yep, that's, what I, that's, my, that's my job. <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'm sort of uh, still, still remembering that wonderful meeting and that corruption energy. So thank you. <laughs> so how, how did you first come across sacred geometry, Michael? You know, only a few weeks ago, I met with my uncle in uh, England and I hadn't seen him for about 10 years. And he was, uh, he told me that when I was two years old, that's a significant number of years ago, he was babysitting for me. And he wasn't a father himself at the time, and he didn't know what to do. He was looking after this two-year-old. And uh, in the house in Ireland, the windows were fogged up. Good old bioarchitecture. There was condensation on the inside. So he was trying to keep me amused. And uh, so he drew the outline of a church, which was in the distance. From his perspective, he followed the line, and he thought that would keep me amused. And he told me just a few weeks ago, and I don't remember this happening, but he said that I watched him doing this. And uh, I, when he finished, I pulled and dragged over a stool. And then I kind of climbed up on the stool. And then I drew an extension to the church. <laughs> <laughs> Your life as an architect, yeah. you should have charged him a fee, you know? <laughs> oh, man. And uh, what was so funny was that about 20... About 20 years later, um, my very first job upon graduation was the extension of a church. So that was, uh, <laughs> it was so prescient. So in terms of sacred geometry, I'm classically trained as an architect, but that really was no introduction to the architect, to the sacred geometry. As perhaps most or many of your listeners would know, it's sacred geometry is not taught as a design philosophy. It's mentioned uh, in, the, in a historical context that perhaps Le Corbusier, the Swiss architect, he, he acknowledged that there are certain proportions in nature and he would, have, he would use it as a modular in terms of his design, but he was quite unusual in that. 
there was some mention then in the Renaissance and Leonardo and so on, but it was never imagined or believed or understood to be a design philosophy that was rooted in the natural algorithms of, of, of how life creates something alive, how life creates a system or a situation or a space that you can actually measure now as Dan Winter and others would, would be able to help us to do so. So in terms of sacred geometry, it was a solo trip. And even though I felt drawn to using certain shapes and proportions and, and geometries uh, in terms of my college and then my early years of, of work, there was nothing supporting me in terms of written knowledge or, or, or treaties or even much of an understanding. And so I turned to feng shui. And that's when I, I was very much uh, drawn and gravitated to, to you and the work you were doing, Roger. And so if you recall, it was uh, 19 years ago, I went across to Massachusetts and uh, I'll shamelessly plug you because after years of trying to make sense of it, in about 20 minutes, you stripped away all the dross and you showed me the essence of the Tao and the yin and yang and the elements. And you put a structure on how nature moves that that was just a breath of fresh air for me. And in the allowing for that deep knowledge, in the opening to it, the shapes just came to me and the sequences and the how it unfolds. And I was seeing it in nature everywhere. I couldn't stop. It was like some, some movie where the CGI was showing that when I looked at a flower, you could see all these shapes and algorithms and, and movements. It was, you know, I can look back and reasonably be described as like a mystical time. It was like, it was revealing itself to me. And I was very lucky that I was working continuously uh, in, in a practice that was giving me opportunity every day to try this out. So it wasn't uh, an intellectual in-depth study where I was just contemplating it for so long. I was applying it. Um, and I've done I've lost count, Roger, but I, I imagine it's well over 500 buildings in the last 30 years. Wow. They're all based in geometry and uh, based on some formation that nature is inviting. And, uh, and so that amount of feedback and that amount of experience, I mean, uh, absolutely, it, it has led me to not just believe, but to know in my core that this is how nature wishes to create uh, a living biofield. So what you've been trying to achieve in your work is this idea of living, you know, like a living dwelling. Yeah. Um, so can you describe some of the principles involved and in what you perceive as a living dwelling? Absolutely. And, uh, and I'll trust you'll ask enough questions to keep me back on track and focused. But I'm particularly interested in a field of study that actually has a name now. It's called neuroaesthetics. And there's even an academy in the, in the West Coast of the States, and possibly more now, because it's a few years ago when I first came across the term. But it is the study of how beauty and visual fractal harmony, how that affects us as, as, at a sensory level, how it stimulates our brain in a certain way, and how that electrical stimulation um, evokes a biological response. And in simple terms, what we see. Uh, graphically or visually is translated into chemical and electrical information that uh, has a cascade effect within our cortex. And apparently when we perceive something natural, a bush, a tree, a forest, a landscape, the face of our mother, you know, something that's designed by nature to be symmetrical. And by symmetrical, I don't mean sort of window, window, door in the classic sense, but an inherent self-organizing principle visually and, and in terms of its shape and its form. We take that in and we take in that visual information that gets translated into a complex electrical signal. And that as it races through our physical brain, it's stimulating all the nerve endings along the optical nerve and it's, it's releasing hormones, it's releasing these uh, molecules of emotion. So we've got the dopamine and the serotonin, and it's creating a feeling of calm and well-being, and it relaxes your sense of self, which allows your identity with the environment to extend. 
So you're no longer an encapsulated, separate being imagining yourself having to continuously negotiate with all the elements in the environment. You're actually allowing yourself to expand your sense of self out into the space to include the space. Yeah. And that's where your natural pulsing living energy uh, extends and includes the physical space. So that means that certain shapes, certain forms, certain movements, feng shui, wind and water, the energy and the containment, that they are naturally set up to encourage and invite and bring together energy, information, uh, attention in such a way that it can re-enter itself. It's like a recursive field of awareness. And Dan Winter would call it like charge density. It's where the, the, the living field of awareness gets to re-enter itself repeatedly over and over again. And each time it does so, it knows itself a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And when it knows itself a little bit more, you've got the birth of self-awareness, self-reference. And when that can happen naturally in a space, no matter what mood you're in, or no matter what your, your psychological position is, the building will begin to shape you. Now, in a way, it's a little bit manipulative, but it's shaping you towards high function. It's shaping you towards optimal biological state. So typically in these spaces, you would find yourself entering into them. Your spine would straighten a little bit. You begin to calm. Your attention is free and encouraged to look around. And everywhere you look, your gaze is met with something fractal. Your gaze is met with something beautiful, literally full of beauty. And beauty can be described as a state where nothing could be added or taken away except for the worst. So it's a natural presentation that biology feels comfortable in and with. And these buildings, for me, shape is most important. Mm -hmm. And once you have the shape and once you have the detailing and the movement and the flow and the orientation, then you can start fine tuning that field with natural materials fine-tuning the, the, the sense of the space by specific positions of things of meaning. And in this case, you don't need excessive ornament because you're not trying to fill the space with meaning after the event. The entire biology of the building is already feeding you at an energetic, psychological level. And we don't need all of these crutches that most modern apartments do, where you just get these straight lines, straight walls, and, and, you know, nothing sacred in, in terms of how the parameters of the space create a field that's able to re-enter itself. It's rare that that happens. And even the word apartment in English, it's, you know, apartment. Ah. It's, it's meant to keep us apart, you know. And that's a whole other subject, but it is deeply connected to it. The idea that what is separating consciousness? What are the conditions and the spaces and the forms that would actually divide our attention and make it into separate boxes? And, and cubic architecture does that. And I wouldn't say it from a negative point of view, but if the predominant number of people listening and watching this, most of them, maybe they spent a little bit of time in a circular yurt at a festival, but most of us are living in... in, in 90 degree structures. And that has an effect on us. Um, and you know, when we talk about a 90 degree angle, uh, in English, the word angle, of course, is A-N-G-L-E. But if you play a little bit with the, with the letters, you've got angel. And it's playful in terms of the semantics and the, and the, and the, the actual structure of the word, but it means a lot. In every mythology, an angel is generally considered a messenger from God. Now, if we take away the guy with the white beard having issues with us, you've got this uh, unified principle of a living field of consciousness that uses mathematics and shape and form as a language of communication and as a, as a way of transferring information from the very long wave and the very big field to the very small. So if that is what we want to call God, if that's a playful use of the word, then angels are messengers of God. They are fields of information that carry a specific signature 
and translate that without interpretation. They're able to hold a specific body of information and gift that to us when needed. So if a 90 degree angle, that's a 90 degree angel. And the geometry of the 90 degree, which is the cubic consciousness, which is 90 degrees or 45 degrees or 135, there's nothing wrong with these shapes, nothing of whatsoever. But the psychology that extends from them is measurably, electrically, and in terms of the geometry of pressure of consciousness, it is a geometry of separation. It is a geometry of compartmentalization, in incubation, which, has, which plays an important role in the evolution of all life because from a seed becoming a tree, there are certainly times that we need to have that sense of safety, that sense of enclosure, that sense of being contained, until we are ready to open. But if that's the only enclosure energy that we get to experience, then it's no mistake that we feel separate. How many people living in an apartment in New York don't actually know their neighbor? You know, they could be 15 feet from another door and they have no idea. And so oh, it's, not, it's very common here. <laughs> really, you know, it's not a criticism, it's just an observation that this geometry and the shapes that we create and we're told that you know 40 or you know 90 degree shapes it's practical it optimizes space in terms of where walls meet it's it's cheaper to do so and yes an argument could be made for this but so what it doesn't take much more to play and that has been my whole exploration of my experience too because the moment you take 90 degrees and if you make that 108 degrees mm -hmm. that is the geometry the angle of the pentagon so when you, get, when you get that shape and you get 108 degrees and you've got a five-sided structure, for example, a room is no longer square, now it's five sides. In this case, you're introducing the geometry of the pent, the geometry of five. And this geometry is about openness, sharing, distribution. It's about connecting. It's, it allows the outside to fall in and for the inside to distribute itself out. So I have direct experience of that when my family and I, about 10 years ago, in the building of this space that I'm in actually at the moment, we had created a pentagonal cabin. And uh, my family and I were living in this pentagonal cabin. And for the first few months of living there, there was a notable, a significant feeling of expansion. And it had a knock-on effect in terms of happiness, in terms of... Um, the openness of communication, the letting in of light, both literally and metaphorically, there was a huge effect. But there was also another effect that began to kick in. I won't go into too much detail because it concerns a personal story, but in essence, this geometry also required total openness. It, it, it evoked and in a way demanded no secrets. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the initial feeling of, wow, I feel so open, I feel so expansive, this is amazing, dot, 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 became a point where psychologically it was impossible to keep a secret. Now, by that, I don't mean everybody was Chinese whispering them, you know, to each other about stories, but there was anything that wasn't in truth, any uh, unconscious imprinted program from your parents from your society any belief system that wasn't based in truth that gets exposed it gets shaken up and it gets shown for what it is and that was my direct experience and it was quite shocking and i'm using that word consciously because it was like an electrical shock it's like you want openness you're going to get it are you ready right. so, um, that was a visceral experience that touched me very deeply and made me have even another level of respect for, for sacred architecture because I realized this is a, and there's another short story as well in this regard. I have only built one structure with seven sides and seven numerologically is referred to as the virgin or the mystical. A seven sided shape known as a septagon is actually impossible to draw with perfect accuracy. Of yeah. course, you can press a button on a computer and you can 
ping it out and print it, so what? But if you're drawing it with a compass and a straight edge, you can get 99.9% .9 accuracy, but not always that little, little residue. Exactly. And so there's something that has always been known about the seven is that you can, you can touch it, you can massage it, you can approach it gently, but it will kick your ass if you get too close. And so at this point when I was doing it, I, I could look back and say I was arrogant um, for sure, but I think it was more a case I was, uh, I lacked the conscious awareness of it and I had a puppy dog enthusiasm. So I felt, let's do seven. I've done everything else. And in this case, it was a seven-sided home for somebody. And after it was built and it looked beautiful, you know, visually looked beautiful and everything worked out well, the client was happy, but there was a series of happenings to them. And I absolutely, I won't mention the name, of course, it's inappropriate, but they had fertility issues. They had relationship issues. They had health issues pertaining to fertility and these things all kicked in now i cannot have any scientific proof to say this caused that but when i look back and i see the specific events and occurrences and uh, conditions that arose very soon after they moved in and they all pertain to the energy of seven so uh i realize this needs the utmost of respect and needs to be used in, in a temple, for example, or in a, a community yeah. structure. You, when used in a house, it's too much for a family. You it's know? almost too, too much of a perfect shape for yeah, a about the document. The virgin energy, because this is important, and it might be very interesting to some of your listeners. In one of the geometries that I uh, built with somebody I worked closely with in the context of a transformational seminar, there was a sequence of geometries. This is about four years ago in a seminar called the Geometry of Love. And people were given an opportunity to walk through a sequence of shapes from a triangle to a square to a pent to a hex to a septagon and so on. And they were made about 20 feet by 30 feet, made out of beautiful quartz crystals in this beautiful seminar space in Czech Republic. And everybody in the seminar was given an opportunity to walk in a linear path through all of these sequences of geometries. And there was one man, I can, I'll never forget this, and he was walking through, and each of the key positions where the attendees were invited to stop and feel the energy of each of these shapes, when he stepped into the middle of the septagon, he did so with not so much awareness. He sort of, here I go, another step. And immediately, Roger, immediately he was, it was like he was kicked where a guy doesn't want to be kicked. It was like he had a physical pain immediately and he doubled over. And I knew exactly what was going on. Because the seven-sided shape is associated with the virgin, with the innocent feminine energy, the feminine energy that's holding the, the secret of life. And it's not to be intruded upon with the, with the masculine, typical masculine focus, the masculine consciousness. It's, it's, it's a sacred, mystical, feminine, virgin energy that is necessary in the spectrum of life to hold the essence of purity. And when he stepped into the middle, as if he was stepping into a football field, you know, or stepping into a pub, he didn't mean to be arrogant, but when he stepped in there, this energy immediately hit him. So I very clearly said to him, take a step back. Now gather yourself. You're stepping into sacred space here. You're stepping into a field of femininity that isn't opposite the male. It's not this sort of um, uh, clashing dynamic. It's a subtle field that will invite you in, but you must be very aware, very conscious, very pure in heart so it was a massive meeting of himself when he then stepped into it he tentatively began to breathe and feel and relax and open up to this energy and he was rewarded beautifully but he said to me afterwards that this has utterly changed him and i met him some months later and he said actually his relationship with the women in his life changed utterly because of this mm -hmm. he was now entering into every relationship 
be it casual, platonic, intimate, romantic, everything, everywhere he stepped, he wasn't nervous anymore, but he was stepping in with this visceral, primal respect that he said was permeating every aspect of his life. And even as a businessman, even as he, as how he did business was affected by this. Mm -hmm. so can you imagine the implications for architecture that we can consciously utilize these geometries to create appropriate spaces? For example, in a community where there is a gathering space, a sacred temple, a priestess um, enclosure, a rite of passage for young men, a place where lovers to get together for their first intimacy, a place to give birth, a place to die consciously. And this is where we can use sacred geometry, not just to create pretty pictures with computer software, but to use it consciously to anchor biological function, biological process, biological ritual, which anchors psychology, biology, and, and touches the living planet so that it's one beautiful field of becoming. Mm -hmm. and that to me is so exciting, so exciting and so important. And so on Michael, um, uh, we could talk all night, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I think we, we might need to switch over to the presentation all just right. in case we all run right. out of time. We can always chat. So I'm gonna press uh, share screen here. Yeah. And you guys gotta tell me if you can see my screen. Oops. So I'm looking to see share screen here, but actually my cursor won't work. Tell me, I'm sorry, but okay. It's so okay. Can you see my screen, guys? No, we don't see that yet. Um, the the share screen button that's that's right underneath the video box. Uh, it's a green button. Share screen. And then there will be a few pop-up options. There we go. It started, Michael. So how's that? It's coming up. Is it open? Your presentation. There you go. No, that's good. There we go. Come Perfect. Very nicely. It's, it's full screen, so that's great. Okay. Wow. What, a, what a shot to start with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And on the right-hand side, am I? I don't want to pollute the screen. I'm looking at. Video. No, you're you're fine. You we're both just shoved over to the right. You're fine. All right, we'll try not to get in the way there, Roger. That's right. Um, this, this image I just put on about an hour ago, um, it's taken from the inside of a sacred chamber that's apparently five or 6,000 years old in Ireland. Uh, I suspect it's older than that, but who's counting? But on the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, the sunrise penetrates through this little hole in the entrance and illuminates the sacred chamber inside. So it's a remarkable place, remarkable energy, and it's pointing to a timeless, ancient wisdom and understanding about the cycles, about the containment of energy, about the receiving. So it's a classic case of feng shui again here, Roger, where the energy of the living planet and the, and the life-giving sun is invited in at a, at a moment, a pivotal moment of regeneration of the cycle of birth and death to illuminate this beautiful chamber inside. And if your viewers can see on the top left, you've got this gorgeous triple spiral that has become synonymous with the Celtic energy. And uh, so this is very much the tradition that I have grown up with that, that has drenched my awareness that continues to inspire me. And this uh, Celtic knowledge is, is deeply affecting. And I feel it very, and it's one of the reasons that I have returned home after many years away, uh, to re, retouch this again, reconnect with it, and to reformulate a whole new iteration of my life um, drenched with this. And you can see at the bottom of the screen, I've, I'm speaking here about Mantic architecture. It's an expression, a title, a a name that I have given to the sort of architecture that I'm engaged in. And mantic comes from a Greek word, which means uh, relating to divination or connecting with divination. So the architecture that comes from uh, an ability, which is not unique to me, but it's inherent in all awareness and biology, an ability to perceive the invisible and make it visible. Mantic means being able to open up to that which is 
not locked into any one place of space and time. It's like a full system view. And when that can be taken in and brought into a focus, the, the light that this is becomes a laser and that the heart and the mind can focus that laser and generate space. And a beautiful quote from our dear friend, Dan Winter, he says, uh, as, as the Sufi masters would say, as only love can bend the light, only love creates. So this beautiful expression is pointing directly to the core of the geometry of love, which is the ability of conscious biology to take light and bend it into itself in such a way that it creates a living field. And that living field allows itself to grow and bring matter to it and shape itself according to its own destiny. So if that doesn't sound too crazy, that's how I wish to uh, play with the architecture. So you can see even the images here on the far right. You've got so this. Michael, I just want to confirm with you that so far we've only got the first slide. Yeah, that's right. Is that correct? Yeah. Here's oh, the okay. second. Cool. Like, it was like last week with Mark. He was, he was on the first slide and it wasn't clicking through, but that's good to see. This is your second slide, yeah? Exactly, yes. Cool. So this is a playful uh, image part, compilation of what's known as cymatics, which is the, the study of vibration in a visual form. And cymatics is effectively um, showing us that when a medium is uh, exposed to a vibration, be it light or sound or some electromagnetics, some, some signal, it begins to take on the shape of that signal. And when we start, uh, when those signals become harmonious and aligned and effectively a geometry of pressure, be it sound or electricity or magnetism, then we see the most gorgeous geometries effortlessly and uh, uh, immediately self-organizing themselves into these gorgeous shapes that immediately appeal to our senses, immediately draw us into center. So architecture has been described as frozen music. And I love that expression. So good architecture is basically a snapshot, a 3D, a 4D, a 5D snapshot of this beautiful sonic harmony, this uh, field of information that has been massaged into a symmetrical form and snapped into reality. And we get to walk through it. We get to sleep there. We get to wake up there. We get to make love there. We get to die there. And this is so, so, so beautiful. And it's such a rare experience because usually the, this geometry was utilized for sacred space, for a temple, for a church, for a synagogue. And we were only able to experience it within a very narrow framework of, of meaning. It wasn't normal for us to be able to be there without a subsuming, overarching context that was generally not of our own making. So sacred space is our birthright, and it's not complicated. It gives us an opportunity to experience the field of creation in a humble, real, visceral way. So this slide is just giving us a sense of the inherent patterns of nature when sound, voice, vibration is given a chance to play with itself. So um, from our... our our good friend, Charles Gilchrist, he's a wonderful artist in the States, and I love his work, and we were in communication, and he creates exquisite artwork based on sacred geometry. This is a compilation of some of his earlier work. His name is Charles Gilchrist, G-I-L Christ. Pretty cool name. And uh, so I'd recommend any of his work. You can Google it, but a wonderful guy. But look at the inherent geometries here. You can see in the top left, when one circle gets a chance to interact with itself, you have the birth of so much meaning, so much symmetry, so much connection. And this is the beautiful dance between the masculine and the feminine. The feminine is about a field of expansion. The masculine is about these lines of connection and meaning and structure. And I love this analogy because it's a deep metaphor for the primary units of creation, the masculine and the feminine, the focus and the field. So geometry is a wonderful way to depict that graphically and allow us to understand it. So when we take this uh, slightly intellectual approach and we allow it to be seen in nature, 
we, we can discover patterns at the subatomic level rising into things that we can see and touch and smell and feel. Plants, uh, roses, uh, entire ecosystems, the geomagnetics of, of a sacred space. And I mean, just look at the images here, guys. You know, you see this flower on the left. If you zoom in and zoom in, you'll see that this gorgeous pentagonal geometry continues to express at smaller and smaller scales. So if you were a bee and your job was to pollinate this beautiful flower, why wouldn't beauty draw you in? I mean, it's no mistake that a flower wishes to open fully, to be seen, to be felt, to be shared. And a bee, it's creating a a field of attraction, a fractal attractive field. And because the bees, for example, are so tuned in to the geomagnetics, they know exactly, they are drawn magnetically, attracted to these flowers. And their whole attention and their physicality will zoom into the center. They will attach the pollen for the flowers and then they will distribute it. So it's life begetting life through beauty. That beauty is the algorithm and the vehicle and the method of transfer for life itself. Cool stuff. There's a branching algorithm that's beautifully depicted here in terms of a tree where the, the, the branch becomes, the, the trunk of the tree becomes the branching, becomes the, the smaller twigs and eventually the leaves. And even though it looks extremely random, it's following such a beautifully precise mathematical unfolding and it's known as the Fibonacci sequence, which approximates what's called the golden ratio, which is effectively a numerical uh, proportional relationship between one thing and another within the context of another. And this is like God's telephone number. It's the mathematics and the geometry of what life does in order to go very small to very big. So if something wishes to distribute and grow and share, it follows this mathematical geometric algorithm. Similarly, if something big wishes to come into focus, same thing again. So this pattern is the optimal path that information will take electrically or physically to distribute itself, to share its energy, to share its momentum, to share its, its entire memory, its being. So pressure waves in a mountain range will break, it, break the land up into this geometry. Trees, snowflakes, also the electrical firing in the brain during a shareable thought. The electrics of the heart when you connect with something, someone. All of these follow this beautiful pattern. Now I'm introducing this image here because about 20 years ago, I was going to meet a client in the south of Ireland. I was running a little bit late because of traffic, but I nevertheless, I felt compelled to take a detour onto this dirt track. I went as far as the car would take me, but I still felt I'm not there yet. And I walked about another mile or so, very aware that I was running late, but I had to go there. And this was 20 years ago, pre-digital cameras and smartphones, but I had my camera with me, my analog um, film camera. And when I entered this valley, I felt a presence. I felt a, a portal, I felt a, uh, some beings effectively communicating with me. And I snapped this photograph and it's so gorgeous. I can't explain or articulate what went on that day uh, because I don't know how, I don't have the language for it. But I, I know that this was a, a meeting, a dimensional uh, portal event, whatever that might mean. And I'm introducing this slide now because consciousness is no different than those beautiful shapes we've seen. The more conscious we are, the more symmetries, the more axes of spin, the more dimensions we're able to inhabit at the same time. So what we call natural intelligence or a level of sophistication that isn't about snobbiness, it's not about how much shit you know, it's about how many dimensions of being that you can integrate and incorporate into your field of awareness non-destructively in terms of, of knowing. And these fields are knocking on our door every moment. They are knocking on our heart, knocking on our nervous system, knocking on our conscious awareness, saying, remember who you are. And here's, a, here's some help. So I wanted to put it in there. Okay, so Roger, if I can jump in and 
show you an example of a, of a design I did actually for Costa Rica. And uh, I'm not sure if this is actually built or not, but it doesn't matter. When I spoke with the clients via Skype, and prior to this, I always imagined that I needed to meet the clients in person. I needed to see the land in person. And I now believe and know to be true that that's no longer the case. In the field of awareness, in the field of knowing, the land is like the King Arthur legend, legend. The land and Arthur were one. We are connected to this field. We're not separate to it. So in the field of knowing, it's merely about access. It's not about banging on the door to demand to be seen or to see. We can access the information of the land anywhere on the planet. We can connect in with the spirit of a place. And we can do so remotely. Because in the field of consciousness, the notion of space and time, linear distance, linear time, blocks of energy, this is meaningless. Consciousness laughs at that. So shamanically, we can connect in with the spirit of a space and we can um, develop clear lines of communication. In this case, when I connected in with the land, I saw the golden spiral, which you can see there are three golden spirals here, depicted as these red lines. And graphically, you see that the spiral is generated out of a series of squares that are all locked together into this spiral dance based on the geometry of the golden ratio, that number again, 1.618 that perfect field of fractal embedding. So there's three spirals here, all of them dancing around the central point. So when you see this image, have a look at the next one now, bang. So that image can be opened up to and played with. So you've got the stability that comes from three, like a tripod, the tetrahedron, the triangle, that zone of stability. But when it's allowed to dance in a spiral form, you get this very masculine structure, but it, it, it provides the safety for the feminine to express. And this is very true in psychology and relationships also. But in terms of a design, what you have here is a design of a house. In this case, a two bedroom home. And in the middle, it has a tree or a little pond, a tiny little courtyard. And you can see there's a flow of energy that's moving into center. In this case, and in the case of classic feng shui, if you were to provide an octagonal or a cubic grid, and you were to radiate out the various zones of feng shui meaning and energetic association, you, would, you, would, you might imagine that there are missing areas in this map. For instance, the top left of the screen as you see it. In terms of feng shui, traditional Chinese feng shui would say, this is a missing area. Oh dear, you're in trouble. But in terms of sacred architecture, feng shui, the wind and the water, the energy flow and its container is in harmony. In this case, the energy is spiraling in and provided a beautiful anchored centering force in the middle. So, and light and movement and heat is allowed to enter into the space appropriately. So in the next sketch, you see how I, the bottom image is imagining what this building might look like. In this case, they plan to use straw bale and natural materials and stone from the land. And they didn't have a huge budget, so they wanted to use natural materials in context. But you can see how the shape of the building is inviting um, a, a 3D form. And it's not crazy. I, I'm, I'm using that word perhaps not very well, but it's buildable. You know, the curves here are not excessive, but you can feel your attention being invited into this building. If you were a photon of light, you would want to die here. You would want to be transformed into awareness in this space. If you were a bird, you'd like to spiral up and land in the tree in the middle. If you were a human, you would be drawn into the center and how it might feel. All right, this is a design for a small cabin. Now, an egg shape is so cool. Those of you who might have access to free range eggs, maybe a country market in the, in the, the middle of Manhattan. But if you, get a, if you get an egg that hasn't long uh, been outside of its mommy 
And uh, if you take the egg, and on the thin end of the egg, if you tip it against the wet tip of your tongue, you'll actually get a little bit of an electrical shock. It's not exactly a, a, a police taser, but it's enough to notice. You'll get a tingle, and that tingle is an electrical event. So there's actually between seven and 12 millivolts of electricity has been measured in an egg. And what's been measured there, that electrical spark is the living field, it's the life force of the egg. And it's the egg is able to generate that, generate that field of electrical integrity because of its shape. The height of the egg and the width of the egg are a specific proportion, a specific shape that creates a vortex of charge inside it which is linked and anchored to the gravity field of the living planet, which generates this charge field. It generates the life force. And if you take this egg and you place it in a, a typical refrigerator, which is a plastic and metal box that we keep our food fresh in, or so we think, the food remains fresh because the low temperature discourages the growth of mold and, and uh, and other organisms that would normally wish to take over. But it doesn't mean that the food is kept fresh in the, in the context of the life force and the electromagnetics. So the egg inside a fridge, that beautiful electrical charge, that signature of life force begins to bleed away, like leaking, it's like uh, hemorrhaging. If you prick your finger here and you get a little drop of blood, you know, your, your, your immune system can handle it, it clots up. But if you prick it repeatedly, you're going to bleed out because your body won't be able to hold your membrane of integrity. There's too much leakage. So if you measure electrically and, and scientifically the life force in an egg on day one, day two, day three, day four, by, by five or six days of being in the fridge, fridge there's no longer any life force in the egg. So what does that mean? I mean, the, the implications are huge. So I mentioned that in the context that when we create an egg-shaped geometry, it's not crazy, you know, it's not crazy to build in. So just look at this again. Um, I could shift the image, but I'm sure you can see it here. This is a small cabin, again, designed for a tropical or semi-tropical environment. So there's a large overhang for the rainy season, but there's two bedrooms, a shared bathroom, a little study, kitchenette, living, dining, and a large overhang. So you can see there's a lovely natural feeling here of inside, outside, enclosure, natural materials, light coming in. And it's where we can utilize the geometry of an egg. In this case, it's an imprinted plan. But if you take the shape of an egg and you bring it vertically, then you've got a dome space, and that's something I can show you later. Okay. Are you happy with the flow of this, Roger? The Fantastic, Michael. Please carry yeah. on. Great. So we, 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 in DNA, we know and we've seen since the 50s when DNA was discovered, even though the ancients have been dancing down and through and with DNA for millennia, for countless generations, but since we discovered DNA, it's usually depicted as two helical lines and with, with, with colored plastic balls. I mean, that's what we see in the, in the science lab. And each of these balls is making reference to an amino acid in the, in the molecule of life. And it's C, A, T, or G, doesn't matter. But if we take away that sort of cubic, particular, pointed uh, perception, and we start looking at the field of information that DNA is held in the bond angles between these amino acids the actual energetic structure of the molecule itself we discover that it's organically consists of a pentagon a hexagon a linear golden rectangle a hexagon and a pent and that's one little rung on the ladder of dna and all together they spiral up and spiral down and the geometry of the pent is about bringing the field of energy from the environment, bringing it in together to be felt. The geometry of the hexagon is about containment, it's about order, it's about fixing. The linear bond angle is about the transfer of clear information. So you've got this breathing in, containing, breathing out. 
So in the essence of life itself, the molecule and the geometry of the living reality of life fundamentally holds this geometry, the geometry of expansion and containment. And even in the, in the use of the language, in witchcraft or magic, we talk about the pent. The pent geometry is used in, mythol in, in mystical, magical arts to project a spell. So the pent is, is sending out a spell. And then the hex, putting a hex on somebody is fixing the spell. I'm not uh, promoting witchcraft here, guys, but just there is a science behind uh, how an intention is expressed in the field and how it's contained in the field. And this is pure sacred geometry. In this case, this was a design for a sleeping accommodation as part of a seminar space. So how it might look on the outside could be very nice. Um, you know, very natural materials, cob, straw, hemp, uh, even 3D printed uh, architecture, which is a whole new thing now. Can you imagine liquid hempcrete, which is a 3D printer is able to print out? I mean, it's hard to uh, replicate the amount of love that can be transferred when you're doing something by hand, but I'm open to all possibilities here, you know, and if you can print a building with a good feeling, then let's do it. Uh, this is for a project in Sweden, and these would be individual sleeping uh, units for people, again, attending a yoga retreat. So a geometry, a field of geometry, becomes a building plan. So if you can just see that dance between the geometry and physical walls, and this was an initial sketch how that might look on the outside. It's uh, how these seeds might create a structure. And uh, the center of this, I'm going to zoom back here, guys. You see the cen center where all of these fields of energy share a common point of reference? And that becomes like a little breathing point. It's like the... It's like the tube, the channel that keeps us connected to heaven and earth. It's that breathing point that allows the field of consciousness to be embedded and shared and distributed. And that one uh, design, you can see on the top left, it could be um, triple, quadruple, pent, and so on. Individual units. All right. So top left, if, if your viewers can see on the screen, that's another image of the very first image again, this beautiful triple spiral. And uh, so this, this image is drawn to me. I love this triple energy. And of course, in a triangle, it'd be very... Now, for those of you watching, I'm not um, Illuminati here evoking some hidden eye. Not my gig. <laughs> but in terms of the geometry of the triangle, Imagining living inside this sort of shape, it would be horrible. You know, it's, it's, it's very constrictive. It's very, it's not for living. But contained within the geometry of this, you can do a lot inside it. And this is for a, a house design, actually, in Ireland that would be following this energy. Uh, all right. In this image, this is actually for a house that will soon be built in Amsterdam, a place where Roger and I have been many times uh, over the years. And this is a, a wonderful client, a family, and they live very near the sea, near where the sand dunes are. And I hadn't spoken to them. They had contacted me with an email, just saying they heard of me and they'd like to, they're not ready to start the process yet, et cetera, et cetera. So that night I had a dream. And in the dream, I woke up and I drew this top image. And... Uh, like, there was no idea of what they wanted. I didn't know what was going on. But the bottom design was what came from that. I actually posted, the next day I sent that top image to them. And I just said, hey guys, this came in a dream. And when the client saw it and said, that's it, build it. And there, were, there was no discussion. There was a bit of minor, minor um, decisions about where to place the, the, the sink. <laughs> but the essence of the design didn't shift. And that bottom sketch, also done by hand, that's what's going to be built. So it's uh, the local neighbors love it, the council love it, and, and they're raring to go. So what came in a dream 
This is why I started using Mantic architecture, because most architects are trained to be able to assess all the different elements of an environment, the budget, the um, official municipal requirements and limits, the, uh, the needs of the client, the, the trees, the prevailing winds, the orientation to the sun. And we are trained aesthetically and intellectually to take all of this mishmash of information, hold it in some sort of coherent way, and seek to navigate a path through it to something that hopefully will work and, be, and look nice. And that does work. It does create beautiful structures. So I'm not in any way judging that process. However, in my experience, it has become a lot more uh, useful, a lot more practical, a lot more special and spiritual, if you like, to not to try and navigate a path through this with the sheer force of will, but to find a center within yourself, a center of allowing, a center of um, openness. And when you can connect in with the field of information that is seeking to be made manifest, the spirit of this building that wishes to be born, the dynamic that exists between the land and the people and the plants and the elementals and the fairies, that agreement, that collective agreement, which optimizes everyone's evolution, that already exists as a pattern of information in the future. So you can remember the future which is what mantic architecture is. It's not about forcing the elements to, into a path that will get to this point. It's about feeling this point so true inside of you that it pulls together everything that's necessary to make it happen. So it's remembering the best possible future. Uh, this is a project I'm involved in where I was living in Czech for the last uh, five years where I was running many of the seminars and working closely with the people there. Um, on the top left, this photograph was just taken last week. And uh, this is an existing structure that's over 100 years old that is far from sacred in the normal sense and meaning of the word. It was literally an old mill building that had been used over the years as a hunting lodge, as a pub, as a hotel, and fell into significant disrepair. So... Uh, my wonderful friends, and it's, it's, it's where I was living, as I say, and, and, and co-creating with them, they put so much of their heart and life force and, and all of their energy into making it into something beautiful. So this is a classic example where you can take something that isn't classically beautiful, but you can develop a beautiful relationship with it. You can speak with the spirit of the space. You can heal you can relate, you can open, and you can ask. And then you've got this gorgeous communion, this beautiful process of co-creation, whereby the space itself speaks to you. It massages your awareness. It invites your senses to take a journey with it. And with sensitivity and playfulness and courage, you can allow a space to to become what it's meant to become. In the same way you would nurture a child from birth into adulthood. In the same way when you meet a lover, you, you seek to discover and touch and express and share the true essence of who they are and who you can be together. So this is a living relationship with the physical and energetic space and you can really play with it. The image on the top left, what's really interesting is there is that there were two roofs, the primary roof meeting the smaller roof. And every structural engineer that assessed what was needed here insisted that there must be two big structural pillars here. And in my heart was collapsing every time they said this. I said, you can't break up this space with two big steel columns. Yet, they weren't prepared to stand over or metaphorically stand under anything other than this. And uh, there is the joke in architecture circles that if you meet a static engineer, they have three sets of braces and two belts holding up their trousers. <laughs> so, of course, they are trained to um, over-specify, to be sure, to be sure, to use that Irish expression. So in the top left, you see 
the roof meeting the other roof, but you can see these arches. You see them? Yeah. That's a physical structure that I built with my wonderful friend from Estonia, a master craftsman framer who, who helped me build my house in Ireland and many of the houses here. So he came from Estonia down to Czech and for a week or two, we contemplated what to do there. Um, and we built these lovely arches. And this arch not only looks beautiful and frames the space, but it does the work that these two beams were asking to do. And you can see the effect on the bottom, on the middle left image, you get a sense of how beautiful that space is going to be. Okay, oops. I, I love this photograph. This is Mel. Mel is the master magician framer from London, Ontario. This is him 15, maybe 17 years ago when I first met him. And he actually was stepping into retirement after 50 years of wonderful work all his life. But he never had an opportunity to build something curvy. And he came on holidays to Ireland. The spirit brought us together. We instantly recognized ourselves without any context as being brothers in arms. And uh, we subsequently opened to do work together. And I designed and he built well over 100 structures in Ireland. And we continue to work together. He's, I shouldn't be giving away his age, but he's well into his 70s and he's showing no signs of slowing down. So uh, he built this structure. This was actually my studio about 10 years ago. I don't think you ever saw this place, Roger, did you? Maybe. Yeah. Uh uh, is that part of the big house in uh, yeah, the, old, the old house yes down in Port Leash but uh so this this was a, a studio that I built for myself but this this was a seminar space now if you are any way familiar with the golden ratio this square becoming a rectangle that contains this spiral you see in the corner window here you've got a dance of the spiral in terms of the feminine curves and the masculine structure this was a seminar space masquerading as a living room. But uh, in its current confirmation, you see it as a, a living room space. But this was able to hold 40 people in seminar format, specifically designed for that. But every element and wall and shape and form and view was, was based on the golden ratio. You can see here even the shoji screens, the Japanese screens, if you zoom in, you've got a square and a golden rectangle. And this is one of my five children here. Her name is Kalia, and uh, her, she's sitting on the right. But just behind her, you get a glimpse into this uh, arched room. This was actually a 12-sided dome space, which I built specifically for her birth. So she was born inside that space, inside a pentagonal birthing pool. And it's such a beautiful experience. Uh, our midwife got delayed in traffic. So Kalia, my daughter's name, she wasn't prepared to wait. You know, she had been in there for nine months and it was time to come out. And uh, so my, her mom and I, we were inside this pentagonal birthing pool. There was no electromagnetics. We had surrounded it in candles and it was warm water in this beautiful sacred space. And Kalia, she, under the water, her head had emerged. And in the candlelight, under the water, I was holding her head and she was smiling at me. I, I swear, I'll never forget it. She was looking up at me and smiling and her, her mouth, under, the, under about a foot of water, her mouth started to move as if she was saying something. I was enthralled, like classically time stood still. And with the next contraction, the rest of her body was beautifully birthed. And my, my wife, she turned around and I lifted Kalia up into her arms. And it was 10 years later, my daughter Kalia, she's now 13, but about 10 years later, I said to her, do you remember when you were born? And she says, of course, how could I forget? It was a great event. <laughs> and I said, do you remember looking up at me? And she said, I do. And I said, do you remember you said something to me? And she smiled and said, I do. I said, come on, you got to tell me, what were you saying? And she said, I can't tell you. And I said, oh, come on, please, you know, I'm sure it's important. And she said to me, I can't tell you. I said, why not? She said, you're not ready yet. Oh, wow. No, and, and she, wasn't, uh, she wasn't manipulating, you know, she wasn't playing some sort of um, game. To her, this was truth, you know?
So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to be ready <laughs> in all of my movements. I'm, I'm hoping to earn the secret of what she said to me, but I suspect uh, the only way to find out for sure is to die successfully. Mm -hmm. so we, <laughs> okay, the, the next few are some images from some of the work. Now, when you see on the left, look at this lovely curve on the left. And the roof, you can see that every beam in the roof is a straight line. These beams are off the shelf materials. Yet, when they are given a chance to follow a curve, they're creating a roof shape that didn't need to be modeled by computer, didn't need to be engineered to the highest level of blah, blah. It's just fix the wall, fix the primary parameter, and let the straight lines do their thing. And it's, it's very, very powerful. It's an amazing way to build. So the, the amount of materials, the actual structure, the shape, the form, is, is effortlessly suggesting itself. If you were to try and model this on computer, a builder would just freak out. But when you know that two walls are having a certain relationship, one is this way, the other is this way, you place the straight lines and they take on the shape. So the level of finish is totally up to you. And this is one of the beautiful things about sacred geometry is that you, you, you make the shape and you choose the level of finish. It can look like a rustic hippie house or it can look like a very high level, you know, polished interior. And this is why when someone asks me, surely this architecture is very, very expensive. In our direct experience, hundreds of examples, the actual physical structure is no more expensive than a normal building in inverted commas. It's sometimes less material, and when done in a certain way, is quicker to do. Mm -hmm. The effect of how it looks eventually is merely a product of the materials and choices of finish. So you can see here, this looks like this should be, you know, 2,000 euro or 2,000 US bucks a square foot, but this house costs maybe one-tenth of that. And uh, I've actually got a client in the States, in California, in San Francisco, and I was speaking with their builders. And when we discussed the likely cost of building, I genuinely thought it was a breakdown of communication. By that, I don't mean an argument. I just mean a misunderstanding. Because they were saying that it's going to be about a thousand bucks a square foot. And I said, you mean a hundred bucks? And they said, no, 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 a thousand minimum. And I said, are you serious? You know, where is this coming from? And the client wasn't freaking out. That was actually the, the cost of building in this area. And I just thought, my word, you know, no matter how unusual the geometry is going to be on this building, I know that if I could suddenly bring in my team, and by that I don't mean I have these guys standing by, but if I were to compile a group of men and women who knew how to do this, you could do it for one-tenth the cost. Even if you did it for one, one fifth the cost, what a win win. So it's amazing. The builder said to me, it would normally cost 500 bucks a square foot, but because it's unusual, we're going to double the cost. And this is a, a very pervading perception in the, in the building world that curves cost more. And that's absolutely not my experience. A couple of images. The one on the right is actually an image inside this birthing space. All right, this is actually where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, it's a little darker outside than this picture. But if you look on the left, you can see sort of at the top of a dome. And that window that you see in the center of that dome, that's this window right behind me. <laughs> so there we go. So this was this house when I was creating it. You can see here that we dug out a large hole in the ground. I think there's a guy in the back taking a pee pee break. But uh, we literally just uh, set the geometry literally in place using a string, the magic string. And there's the magic string <laughs> in the air. And this, and this is my office again here. You see it's aligned with the little moon right above it. So we decided to do things a little unusual. We decided to build the roof first. So what you see in the left-hand image is one of the beams. Pure Together. 
So you can see this beautiful structure that seems to be dancing with the very fundamental geometry of life itself, creating this. And you can see the Canadian flag there. They couldn't, they couldn't, uh, because it's interesting, the Canadians were, and it was a team primarily consisting of Canadians and Estonians. Now, I know that geography is not necessarily the number one subject for many Americans, you know, but uh, for those, Estonia is a um, ex-Soviet beautiful country in the Baltics. It's there in um, very eastern, north, northeastern Europe. But it's a, it's a beautiful land full of people with great energy and great uh, enthusiasm. So a team of Canadian master craftsmen met with a young group of inexperienced but enthusiastic practical Estonians. And they came together in sacred union and became this team. And so usually there was a competition to see who could put the, the Canadian or the Estonian flag higher. But usually the Estonians were a little bit more um, adventurous and no matter high, how high the Canadians put the flag, the Estonians found a way of putting it higher. So it's just, a, it's nice to see um, that the energy of what would normally be viewed as a field of separation would come together to create something in unison. And this is the, the front section of the, the house, the space, the home. And the left image is actually where I am at the moment. I'm going to tilt the screen. I'm not sure how the... Yeah, it's coming up good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that, um, whoops, that's the space above me. Uh, looks like uh, yeah. eagle, eagle's feathers. Yeah, and each of these shapes is utterly drenched with sacred geometry, yet you can see it's not contrived, it's not rigidly, rig I was gonna say religiously, I guess that's true too. It's neither rig uh, uh, no, no. Rigid, rigidly nor relig religiously, um, imprinted it's a natural flowing expression of what can be and this is the reciprocal space on the other side of the house so that the space on the left here this dome is matched on the other side with this uh, bedroom space all right so this is how the house looks from from the air and it's still in need of some landscaping uh, but you can see here on the right hand image that's, you know, typically we would have a four poster bed, but uh, I like to do things a little differently. So here's a five poster bed just to mess with you. But uh, we've got the five elements in, in, in the Chinese system, but also the pent. So the top down view of DNA is actually a 10 sided shape known as a decagon. So when you lie in bed, you're looking up and you're being this, this shape is beaming into your awareness, either looking at the stars or looking at the sun or the clouds. It's a lovely, restful shape that's literally imprinting into your visual cortex. So you had mentioned uh, that some of these transformational seminars, I work very closely with a wonderful woman. You've met her, of course, um, in, in, you, you hosted us two yeah. years ago, um, I think it's two years ago, this month actually. Yeah, the sacred Geometry Celebration in New York. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we, we, it was very well attended. You did, you did a fantastic job pulling all these um, New Yorkites together into a sacred space. And what's really amazing, if you remember, is that you manifested a space which from a classic perception wouldn't be considered sacred, but in terms of the intention that you and your crew put into it and the safety and the energetic integrity of the event itself, we were able to step in and to use stones. If you remember, we used stones and crystals that uh, one of your participants uh, brought to us. And we created a beautiful geometry, very similar to what you see in the bottom right. And the course participants and the attendees were given an opportunity to walk through this geometry with a specific intention. And this, these shapes, these forms, these geometries, and these fields affect our aura, affect our bioenergetic field. They shift our consciousness. They open our mind and our heart to primary fields of imprinted truth. And we do many, many, many seminars. Uh, usually, like every weekend, there's another seminar going on in Czech 
which take these geometries and evoke them, invoke them, and utilize them consciously, respectfully, to create a, a ritualized experience, which gives our field of awareness a chance to be imprinted with truth, to be re-imprinted with the primary geometry of pure consciousness. So inside this experience, any pattern of information or energy that is no longer supporting us or driving us towards optimal function, these geometries and the process with them literally reprogram us to function at a much more natural and fuller way. So have a look at the top right here. This is actually a seminar um, that my friend, her name is Karami, that my friend does in Czech. So this is, this is a seminar specifically for DNA. This seminar is about reprogramming DNA. And it's about um, releasing any imprinted information that was inherited or as assumed or imprinted through traumatic experience, through um, generational genetic memory downloads, through uh, personal histories and, and traumas, releasing them, containing them, and opening up a new imprint. So even just observing, visually looking at these images, can you imagine walking through them with the depth of ritual, with the, with the intention clear and, and, and contained? So in the middle left image, you've got the DNA geometry shown as a series of shapes and forms. And then walking through it, it's such an experience, such a powerful transformational movement. This is yours truly, uh, setting up a geometry. This was about four years ago. And again, this was a, an anchoring of a particular intention. Now, what's wonderful is that when collectively people get a chance to experience this en masse, there is an event or a, a state or an, an unfolding that is so much more than the sum of the parts. And by that, I mean that everyone brings something to it, but in sharing it in unison as a community, as a group, as a collective, the effects are amplified massively. It's not one plus two plus three plus four. It's one times two times three times four. It's a massive accumulation of love of intent, of shared agreement, that we're all moving towards ever greater expressions of love. This is a, an aerial view of a beautiful geometry that I put together just last December in celebration for the winter solstice. In Czech, it's called Slunovrat. And this was a concert that my friend did in Prague City. And there was about a thousand people there. And that's me. Uh, doing the geometries just before the event. So there was a meditation. There was a, a guided meditation. That's my friend on the right uh, in the white dress. And this geometry acted as a locus point for the intent, the collective intent, not just to honor the cycles of change, the cycles of this um, shortest day, longest night, but also to introduce and open the entire audience of around 1,000 people to what it means to really connect and feel this time. And of course, you, wouldn't, you would be forgiven for recognizing the, um, the Celtic motif. I couldn't resist it. It's in my blood. But if you see the, a lady on the left and she's wearing a red dress, if you look to the person just behind her in white, you can see there's a pregnant woman. And she's a friend of ours. And... She gave birth a few days after this event. So she felt that during this event, she couldn't take her eyes off the geometry and she could feel her baby continuously moving with, with, with this dynamic. It was like the baby was getting uh, a GPS navigation for its next move. You know, it was time to move. Uh, here's a, just a compilation of some images very organic, very geometric, but utilized for the purpose of, of ritual again. So you can see here that these buildings, in this case, these are buildings, they're energetic structures 
of which we see here the floor plans effectively, but they're creating the field effect that is drenched in meaning and anchored into a cycle of change and, and, and a movement that's necessary. So one of the last images here, uh, I'm running seminars specifically because sacred geometry, uh, Roger, has taught me not in a cold mathematical way or a specifically scientific way, but I'm really, really uh, driven to understand at a visceral, energetic, sensory level, the interplay between the point and the line, the point, the line, the field, between the masculine desire to focus and connect and derive meaning and model reality, that and how that dances with the feminine field of expansion and feeling and inclusion. And sacred geometry is a wonderful metaphor that's so real and visual and connecting to, to explain and understand and practically utilize the essence of masculine and feminine dynamic, the dyad of yin and yang, the breathing out, the breathing in, the touching, the connecting, and the meaning. And so many of the seminars I am doing for men, because so many men in my experience, so many men, they are experiencing an existential sense of loss. They're not sure of who they are, why they're here, what's their mission, what's their purpose. And contained within the field of the feminine, which is life, paying the mortgage, the car loans, the credit cards, the, the, the work, the children, the life. For most men, in my experience, there is a, an existential sense of who am I in this craziness? What's going on? What's next? How can I anchor myself in this field? And for many men, they can only escape. And they do so through alcohol or through meditation or through shamanic drumming or obs obsessive uh, compulsive behavior. Very few of them are able to navigate the field of change and do so with a stability inherent in life itself. And so I'm seeking to create archetypal events for men that would anchor geometrically and energetically anchor the archetypal principles of the king energy, the warrior energy, the magician and the lover. So in the context of sacred geometry, the king energy is the archangel energy. It's the ability for heaven and earth to be met with understanding, to be held as a field of truth. That's the king energy. The magician energy is about understanding this in terms of psychology, technology, magic, alchemy, knowing how to use this information and this energy and practically move with it and dance with it. And the warrior aspect of all of this is about being able to engage with the energy, to physically connect with it, ground it in our bodies, discipline our minds and our physicality to work with this, to become modern Jedi Knights. And the lover archetype is about feeling it all. It's about connecting it all together, introducing meaning and connectivity and purpose. So the king knows what must be. The magician knows how to bring it about. The lover gives it meaning and the warrior stands strong and makes it so. So this is where practical sacred geometry, not just in the utilization of a design philosophy, but in terms of how we move through life, how we upgrade and balance and harmonize our health, how we optimize and utilize our abundance, and how we build deep and meaningful relationships, which are ultimately opportunities to express this geometric dynamic between masculine and feminine. So this makes me feel so passionate, so alive, so focused. And I feel uh, more energized, younger, and more ready for this at every stage. So my architecture, these transformational seminar events, my one-to-one -one consultations, it's all taking on every day a new, a new energy, a new pattern. And as I continue to clear my own stuff and open up the potential, this information continues to inform and fill uh, my senses to optimal function. The last um, image, yeah, the last image here. Uh, Michael, pe 
people can actually connect with you on your Facebook page about that. Yeah, is it, is it Michael Rice seminars or? Is it no, it's actually just Michael Rice. I, I, I lost the seminars on it. Just Michael Rice. And uh, I'm sure you guys can kind of uh, exchange my email as well. It's simply Mantic Architecture, one word, at gmail.com. And Mantic is M-A-N-T-I-C, Mantic Architecture at gmail.com. So we need to leave some time for some questions, Michael. Do you want to just... Um Finish, was that the, the last slide, was it? The last slide showed a rose. And uh, uh, I've lost it now, here we go. So let me get to the last slide because it tells everything. This last slide, a beautiful white rose. Now, let your viewers just, where is your attention naturally drawn? You know, just feel, feel the essence of this rose. You can see how it's all the petals are creating this gorgeous spiral that's inviting your attention to fall into the center. And a rose at night closes up. And during the day, it opens up again. And all the petals are shaped in such a way that they're spooning each other like a glorious intimate hug at nighttime. They're all allowing themselves to imprint and embed and hold each other at nighttime where they can take in the memory of the day and share it fully. And then when the sun rises again, they're opening up for full expression. And it's a beautiful metaphor, not just for this breathing in and out, for this connection of yin and yang, of openness and, and breath and meaning and radiance, but it's also showing us that the contracted state of masculine focus and stillness at the night is matched by the feminine openness and the radiance during the day. And what's so lovely is that the sun, mythologically the sun is associated with the masculine power and the moon, the nighttime with the feminine power. So what's really interesting is that, that the rose becomes concentrated and focused as a masculine state in, in the radiance of the feminine environment of nighttime. And then in the day it becomes a feminine openness to the, the masculine sun. I like this interplay. And especially in terms of relationship, in, in terms of intimacy, in the openness and the closing of the breath of life itself, and the giving and the receiving, the balance and the interplay of two wonderful forces, alive and true within each of us, but beautifully played out in dynamic sacred relationship. Not just one-to-one, -one, but in the essence of a sustainable family, a sustainable community, a sustain sustainable global economy economy and global ecology so the beauty of sacred geometry is that it's not scale sp specific it applies at all scales so we can apply this geometry not just to a thought or a shareable breath or a kiss or a cuddle we can refer it to an entire global culture and, and beyond of course so to me so sacred geometry is a map it's a map of relationship. Beautiful, fantastic, beautiful presentation, my friend, my dear friend. I'm going to hand it over to Henrietta because we need to leave some time for some okay. feedback, some discussion, uh, maybe there's some questions, some comments that right. uh, Henrietta will um, communicate through for us here. So I'm going to yeah. stop the screen share there, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michael. We've all been You're just mesmerized the whole time people are saying this was wonderful yeah it was extremely in-depth and um fascinating where you took us uh you know i really i really called on myself to this spirit of the building that wishes to be born sort yes. of yes. yeah just that 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 applies to everything and you you really outline that throughout your talk thank you, thank you so much uh, let's see i don't actually have any questions I think we've all just been riveted, <laughs> really. You could have gone on. You could have gone on for many more hours. And let me just see if there's something in the chat box. No, people just saying that was wonderful. Um, Michelle's sharing a story about her youngest daughter's been eating graham crackers during the talk. She keeps breaking them into smaller and smaller rectangles and comparing them to each other, <laughs> which was a beautiful thing. 
And uh, we've had a few comments about that story about your daughter, by the way, mm -hmm. in that chamber that she was born. You know, that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, Vincent says, incredible session. Thank you. I was blown away. So you've really, yeah, you've really Thank moved you. us. That, does, is anybody out there wanting to come on and share either a story or a comment or have a question for Michael? At the moment, we have no questions. Well, let me just, let me just uh, play with something, if I may. Please the, do. We, we, we know of caesarean birth, and caesarean birth, I'm sure everybody knows what it is. It's, it's not a natural birth in the purest meaning and sense of the word. And it comes from Caesar, Julius Caesar. And uh, apparently, he was the first uh, recorded caesarean birth and his mother died during the birth process and julius caesar spent his life waging war against the sacred feminine effectively he just he he wrecked he reaped havoc across central europe across germania and gaul and he effectively destroyed the uh celtic the original druidic pagan celtic culture so i'm not being judgmental over the guy everything happens for a reason but a lot of his biography and his life was effectively waging war against the feminine and when a child is cesarean birthed now i i'm i must be careful here and i must preempt this because i am not please 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 i am not saying every child who's cesarean is like this but when we look at the pure principle, when a woman is giving birth and she feels these contractions, it's impossible for her to say, uh-uh, I will wait a few minutes, this contraction, I'm not ready for it. The contraction comes and it is a pressure wave that, that is anchored like those Russian dolls, one inside the next, inside the next, inside the next. It is a fractal wave event that's anchored to galactic, planetary, ecosystem, local geomagnetics, physical space, the woman's body, the actual muscular waves of the contraction of her uterus, her birth canal. So the child's brain in the moving through this pulsing birth canal, as the child's head is going through it, all the, the, the plates of bone are not fused together so they can be molded and squished with this pressure wave and it's literally imprinting the child's cortex with the map of knowing that connects the planet and the baby that connects the galaxy so it's not a local field effect it is a massive context of wave information, cymatically imprinting the child's awareness. So when they get through this birth canal, their cortex has been massaged and imprinted with their full memory, with the full event signature of their first breath. And when they take in the air and their meridians activate and the chi begins to flow independent of the mother with their first breath, that is a signature phase lock of that space and time of birth. That's where they get imprinted with their astrology. Um, and I don't wish to uh, uh, you know, scare anyone away with that comment, but um, it's, it's literally the, the divine, unique signature that each of us carry that's imprinted at that moment. So that's why natural birth is optimal, of course. Now, a child born caesarean will still open up and be beautifully, happily nurtured and open up to their full potential. There are no mistakes. But when we allow for a conscious birth with the full understanding of what that means energetically, physiologically, architecturally, then we can optimize the child and mother's um, chances of health and harmony and, and a viable immune system and a deep deeply connected psychology and everything necessary to give the child the optimal state for growth and emergence. Now, if we go to the other end, and I'm, I'm, I'll shut up if there's a question there, but just to talk about death. 
Now, death in most cultures is viewed as a negative thing because we are so scared and separate. We imagine death is the end and then we don't believe that there's an afterlife and so many things that are limiting our ability to fully perceive the beauty and the continuity of life and living systems. And we've got Dan Winter, our wonderful friend, and many others who have a beautiful understanding, both scientific and spiritual, about what it means to die successfully, what it actually might mean for, to take our, our consciousness as a field, as an embedded fractal field of awareness, and what would it take at the point of physical release for that consciousness to open like a rose and to, to dance with the, with the geomagnetics of the sacred space you're in and to go home. And this is the essence of the shaman who she would ask the tribe to build a mound of earth in the same shape as the sacred mountain in the distance where their ancestors lived. And she would sit on this or lie on this little mound of earth and she would die consciously and she would unpack and release her, her bioelectrical field. And immediately, because of the shape similarity between the mound of earth and the sacred mountain, her consciousness would unpack fractally and would uh, inhabit the sacred land. And this is where her consciousness has an acceleration of charge and it's, it inhabits the land. And she can choose to stay in the land and guide the next generation or she can get the acceleration that her consciousness needs to travel to the stars. And it's very beautiful. So can you imagine in a conscious community creating an architecture where you could die successfully? Creating a structure where you would, you're not in this metal building or metal bed, you know, hooked up to machines that go bing, 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 and uh, surrounded in people that are grieving or don't care. You're actually surrounded by loved ones that can choose to gift the full package of love that they have experienced and created with you over a lifetime and gift that back to you as a field of love and appreciation and energy. And that field is able to be brought into focus so that at the moment of death, your transition is celebrated, amplified, and, 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 and raised literally to the roof. So your consciousness is anchored to the living planet and, and dancing with the field of love that you have generated over your lifetime. So in the same space, you could have a conscious birth and a conscious death. And then everything in between is about making love effectively. I think we've, uh, I think we've got some more questions, Michael, coming through. Hey, Maria. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Michael. I just You're before welcome. I ask me some questions, um, just a few comments here. Um, Mark mm -hmm. says to you that this is the perfect conclusion to the series and the presentation that resonated most for me, mm -hmm. and that he's looking forward to experiencing your seminars in person. Ah, um, just wanted to pass that on. Thank you. And um, also, I had a, a viewer a participant asking that. To explore your one-on-one -on -one sessions, what what are they exactly? Like, how would you describe your one-on-one? So they just, just so can let people know about that. Yeah, it's usually uh, via Skype, and my Skype address is one word: bioarchitecture. And uh, you know, perhaps you can include that in the information profile. And uh, it's usually one hour, but then what's an hour? You know. Let me show you something here. I have a. I have this, <laughs> it's exact, exactly one hour. <laughs> so this is my, um, my analog uh, Skype session timer, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but of course, yeah. So rather than a machine that goes bing, I've got these sand dial moving. So the Skype session is typically an hour. And it's not as if I have a, uh, a menu of processes or, or uh, techniques that I use. I trust that whoever's coming to me and wishes to open the space with me, that there is a shared knowing that something needs to be released or expressed. 
Sometimes people come because they're not sure of who they are or they want some sense of what's the next step. Others come with a specific problem that could be related to architecture, but more often than not is pertaining to something relationship, either to themselves or their loved ones. So because I don't claim to be an expert in anything, there is a, an inherent openness. And that's not false modesty. I just know that I don't know you. You know, so in that uh, acceptance that I don't know, there is a, a general relaxation which allows for a receptivity. So when the energy opens, personally, for whatever combination of reasons, I start receiving images, shamanically, geometrically, and I don't jump on them and try to give them meaning. I hold them like you would hold a newborn baby. And it's, it's, it's held uh, lovingly, and the meaning presents itself within the context of a sharing. So sometimes it can be specific advice, but uh, I usually seek to create a field of support and information. And, uh, and, and because the people themselves, they know the truth of what they need. It's not for me to tell them what they need, but I can provide a sacred space effectively whereby they can feel and sense, perceive and formulate their own movement from that and uh i haven't actually described it before so hopefully that makes some sense yeah, yeah no it it totally does it's it mm. really does thank you so much i just wanted to i'm so glad you can um tell us that because people were curious and that that's mm. very clear it's very interesting to me that you just said that you you might you get a sort of geometric shape download you know that in the context of what you do well, for a living um but i've said I've heard other sort of psych, uh, people talk about that, healers and, you know, shamanic practitioners, whatever you want to say. Um, when, when a client, Henrietta, when a client comes to me first, mm -hmm. I don't say, well, listen, what's your vision? What's your dream? What's your budget? What's the conditions? I, the first thing I ask the client is, look, before we do anything, what's your passion? Yes. No? Yeah. And quite often they're very surprised with the question, no, are, you, are you sure you're an architect, you know? But... Um, yes. It's in the asking. The answer itself is not important. But if I ask you, you don't have to answer, but if what's your passion? Something shifts in you. And even if you don't know specifically what it is, you're kind of thinking, wow, what is my passion? You know, I love working with plants. I love this. I love that. And mm -hmm. something in you changes. And it's like your primary soul pattern, your destiny, your mission, your most sacred held dream. This is given a chance to express and in that moment that sacred dream has a shape i firmly believe that i know it to be true we all have a specific cymatic pattern that is our unique soul purpose that's really and, true yeah. and so if you get a chance to express it for whatever combination of reasons i perceive that in my field as a symbol or a geometric form or some structure or shape or, or, or symmetry. And I invite that to become a building. Mm. So rather than it being a two-dimensional mandala floating above your meditation hut, this actually becomes the physical structure of your building, of your home. Yes. So can you imagine living in a structure that is the, the imprint of your most sacred purpose? Yes, I, I totally can. I've been thinking about it all the time. And I, a lot of people have been commenting on that, that, that this is something that uh, is very yeah. important. You've really hit on something of deep importance. Yeah. I, I want to, Michael, jump to some of these con uh, questions. Please, please do. And uh, uh, Jeremy says that I'm slightly um, going in and out. Is that right? So Jeremy, do you want to? If you want to ask a question, just so I don't um, lose any of it for everyone, you want to ask Anne's question first, Jeremy? Yeah, let me do that. Um, let's see. So, so okay. So Anne's question is: uh, I am curious. Oh, let me turn on my video. Sorry, guys. Um, there we go. I am curious about structures such as uh, the, Chart the Chartres uh, Cathedral, built on the ancient Druid site in France, on top of five wells, a pentagon, and it is not. It is not aligned east-west, but rather along the same angle as Stonehenge. Do these people understand what you're talking about? 
Very much so. Um, most of the churches were built on sacred sites. It was part of the Catholic invasion in a way. And uh, growing up in Catholic Ireland, I can speak to the invasionary nature of the whole thing. So it's a, uh, they would of course recognize that these places and these confluences of sacred streams and, and uh, upwellings of the goddess energy, they of course imprinted the structures on top of them. And they did so to access and amplify, contain and utilize the energy of the earth. They did so for specific reasons and specific purposes, and I'm not going to denigrate the whole thing, but they knew what they were doing. And the actual divination of the site, remember that the stone masons, the, the free masons, prior to being infected by another type of um, consciousness, they were men and possibly women, but predominantly men, who were very educated and experienced in understanding geometry, working with divination, working with the energy of the earth, and anchoring telluric geomagnetic forces and containing them within stone structures. So they did so to amplify the human voice, to amplify the glory to God, of God, to God, and they did so to anchor the power base and the strength of a belief system. So yes, they would be gravitating naturally to existing sacred sites. So it wasn't just uh, imprinting the masculine in a predatory way on top of the feminine. It was also utilizing the force um, of the land and the energy to do so. But remember what I said, that architecture is frozen music. Many of these churches, short cathedral included, they are beautiful, beautiful harmonic structures. They're designed with such a level of exquisite sensitivity. They are tuned beautifully to the fractal inclusion of the human voice in praise of God. So, you know, the dance of light and materials and structure and meaning is very, very, very beautiful. And when you take away the underlying predatory nature of the belief system, then you've got a very sacred site. And, and why not? I'm not sure if that answers the question, but they would certainly be aware of the ley lines, the dragon lines, the chi lines, the natural telluric maps of the land. And they would both position these buildings and orientate them accordingly. Mm. Uh, that's a great answer. Uh, Henrietta, let's try and squeeze in these remaining questions because yeah, or just yeah. yeah, time. Um, actually, Jeremy, can you hear me now? I'm just, I was just going to jump to... Mm -hmm. um, John's question at the end because the other two are kind of observations so I want to make sure that the questions are answered and mm -hmm. um, John is asking you Michael he says I was I was wondering if you can discuss the development of your children having grown up in these sacred geometric structures I would imagine that it would open up the creativity and an understanding of nature by living in these sacred shapes and structures from a young age I remember one of my daughters, Maya, she came running in when I was with some clients once in my sacred space, and I was in full ranting flow with the clients about sacred this and sacred that. She didn't know I had clients there, so she ran in, saw I was busy, shook her head and said, oh, not sacred shit again. <laughs> <laughs> and ran out again. And my clients and I were just left in silence. So... It's not as if my children sort of levitated into every space. They grew up with this as normal. Now, we chose to home educate our children, which I understand is quite common in the States, but not so much in Ireland, and actually mm -hmm. illegal in most of Europe. And uh, so my, my kids grew up in a very natural learning environment. So the spaces encouraged um, concentration when necessary and openness when invited. So absolutely, they... The variety of different spaces encouraged different usages. That was a natural expression of whether they needed a space to be quiet or whether they needed a space to dance around and express. So, yes, the com not the complexity, but the variation of different geometries and different energy fields invited different expressions of natural learning. You know, a time to, to go in and feel and read or a time to open and express. So for sure, a beautiful quote from uh, Winston Churchill, that first we shape our buildings and then they shape us. 
And so, so just the piece, you know? Yeah. And I, I love, I'm actually designing a school in Prague at the moment. And uh, it's very interesting because the developer, well, the client is a woman who really gets this, but the developer is a very left brain, masculine, straight line builder. And he utterly cannot feel the, the, the importance of creating sacred geometry. He's looking for the cost per square meter and the straight line, low cost masonry options. You know, and uh, it's, it's like a classic timeless battle between the masculine and feminine. You know? But yes, learning environments absolutely need sacred geometry to optimize education, which comes from the word educo, which means to naturally draw forth our true essence. Yes. Rather, rather than imprinting a belief. Totally. That, that's exactly it. Um, Jeremy, I'm going to ask you to do the last bit just because I'm worried about my connection. But thank you, Michael. That wonderful thank answer. You. Yes, thank you. Sure. Are you referring to uh, Vincent's question? Is that the same for you? Yes. Yeah, okay. and then uh, Anne had made a follow-up comment about Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Anne was saying about Shart, uh, Shart just uh, in response, that uh, very in intriguing labyrinth that seems to be very energetically charged. Uh, when I have felt as energy, it is so much more than a place to walk and meditate. I truly wonder what the ancients knew and understood that we were only beginning to discover. Thanks for just commenting on your reply. Um, but this one by Vincent is asking, uh, watching from air an airplane window, noticing the rectilinear shapes of cities and towns. I think it would be like, uh, I think what it would be like to live in a city respecting spirals and sacred geometry principles. <laughs> that would be something, wouldn't it? Well, uh, we always wanted to build that one, didn't we, Michael? In fact, we've got, we've got writings and uh, manifestos. Uh, you know, we've got a manifesto called The Living Dwelling and Bloom the Desert, bloomthedesert.com. You know, one of my dreams is actually to build a living city uh, in the middle of nowhere and actually make it sustainable. And we've actually got all the technology. We can do that. We've got, you know, the Vastu Sastra, the Feng Shui, the Eco Design, the Sacred Geometry, you know, the, you know, the, the power of food and spirituality and, and the economics. And, you know, and we can, we can actually do it, you know, build these living vibrating communities, you know, and there's some folks, of course, have done it on a, on a small scale, but not in a, uh, like a new living city, you know, in India, they actually build dozens of new yeah. cities just every year because of the population growth, you know, uh, so that's why I feel that we should actually do it in the desert, make a beautiful, uh, you know, living city and, and uh, sort of start again, you know, and uh, you know, I don't want to see on anybody, any, any, anybody's feet, you know, by doing it too close like to Like Santi. Yeah. <laughs> if I could address that point, um, if we take a natural environment, which is effectively the skin and the membrane of the physical planet, the energetic goddess herself, if we come along and if we Im impose, albeit a very beautiful geometry, if we impose it on top of the land, in my more recent experience, even though it looks beautiful and can be wonderfully presented in graphic form, it's still an element of arrogant masculine superposition of an idealized form onto, onto what is a very natural feminine environment. And it's yet another pseudo-spiritual imprinting of, of masculine arrogance. So there is a path that we need to walk on which is about a conscious union between the masculine and feminine, whereby it's not a imprint of a geometric rigid form onto a landscape. It's a, an, an, a natural allowing, a utilizing the coalescing principles of geometry to create local fields of attention and life force buildup but, but recognizing, celebrating, protecting, and amplifying the natural feminine energy points. So working with them when they're there, creating new ones when they're not. And that's a very new dynamic. It's not imposing a rigid geometric structure onto a feminine landscape, nor is it just mindless, mindless organics. So there is a lot to be learned and a lot to be gained from understanding the interplay between the masculine ability to provide an anchor for the feminine 
and the feminine's ability to give meaning and flow to the masculine. I don't want to get too philosophical, but what I'm saying is that in a natural environment, we need to work with what's there and add beauty to it as opposed. And, and that's the essence of a conscious relationship. We're not trying to change our woman into some idealized form to suit our own needs. We're celebrating what is and supporting what could be. And that's sacred architecture and the sacred relationship. Yes. Well, Michael, that's been a, a, a wonderful presentation uh, because of time. I mean, we <laughs> believe me, we could we could listen to you all night. Um, yes, we could. It's, we uh, it's been two hours now, so I think. Uh, yeah, it's three o'clock in the morning. My time. What's yes. that? It's three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, a bit of you need to get a little bit of uh, shut eye. So, okay. Michael, thanks again. You know, Michael, I like to do things a little differently. Rice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. It's been a privilege to be here. And uh, thank you to all the listeners, those that are current with us and who will listen to this afterwards. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. And Henrietta, if you can upload my coordinates, so if people do wish to contact me, I'm uh, very much open for business in the purest sense and meaning of the word. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we've got your email in there right. and the Facebook page. If people get lost, they know that I'm at, you know, academysacredgeometry.com. They can just email me info at, and I can always pass on your present details, sure. uh, you know, where you are and what you're up to. Mm -hmm. and, um, so things coming up in the, um, the near future, uh, Evolver are, are sort of talking a little bit about a, a new series, possibly in the autumn time here. You know, maybe in October, we'll, we, we might get a, another series together. So uh, obviously you guys on the database, um, you know, you'll be all informed about that. There's nothing in concrete. I did actually see Ken today from Evolver and we started to discuss it a little bit because this series has been a, a fantastic success. Uh, the feedback that we've been getting uh, from about all the wonderful presenters you know, yes. I'd like to thank uh, Paul Harris and Mark Hampf and Scott Olson, Dan Winter, and I've probably forgotten, <laughs> probably forgotten half the people that I should be thanking. Right? <laughs> Sorry if I've forgotten you. And uh, Michael, just a great way, somebody commented, what a great way to finish the series tonight, you know, with your uh, presentation. It, it was r remarkable. And it's just it's so good. It you know, hang out with you, you know. I miss yeah, you, my yeah. friend. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I'll, be, I'll be back in Prague and <laughs> Ireland soon. We, are, um, we always, we always find a way of meeting each other, Roger, you know. I'd like to thank the Evolver team, uh, Jeremy, Henrietta. Henrietta, do you want to say just a final few words? Well, I just want to thank all the people out there who participated in your fantastic six part series Roger I mean thank you really as you just reiterating what you said thanks to all those fantastic guests that brought so many different things to the table and Michael a truly wonderful way to wrap everything up just bringing it into that physical reality that we live in every day and all the creativity I mean that's just made me think of all the spaces as everybody was commenting that we exist in every day you know whether it's offices or apartments and houses and how much more creative we could really get with that as we saw from your own home <laughs> and the spaces that you've yeah. been working in and, and, this, and uh, this, this 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 space i call it genesis this home but perfect it's, yeah. it's a home for it's not a home for me it's a space that's still in the process of becoming but it's, yes. a, it's an anchoring space for a wonderful future and it's a very it's going it's going to play it already is but it's going to play an increasingly important role not just in the energetics and evolution of ireland but i know this space is very important and it's the reason that it called to me to bring it into being and uh i can't stress that enough there's something going on here that's so much bigger than just a nice space it's of it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's calling for something and if anyone out there is feeling drawn to connect with me specific to this space i'm very open because it's a uh, it's in the process of coalescing consciousness into a movement yes that's that's, that's that's means something and i'm i'm feeling it 
and I'm open to support it. It's my mission now to bring this into full light. Well, actually, what, what you'd said was this collective agreement of the spirit yeah. of the building. And I, I feel like that's sort of Roger, what you've um, what you have done with this whole webinar series. It's, you've really brought these pieces together that we can go out and explore much more deeply and further. Reach. And Will and everybody out there. So we definitely want to be doing more work with all of you <laughs> again. That's for sure. Yeah, and and uh, I'd like to thank Henrietta and Jeremy. Thank you for holding the space and keeping it technically and energetically clear and, and really smooth. And Roger, uh, yet again, my friend, my brother, uh, you've been tirelessly and and against so much energy over the years, continuing to produce amazing events wonderful programs bringing people together all over the world and, and may you have many more decades going to iceland this year i'll just put my final yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely and uh i'd love to be part of that you know uh, you know well you know maybe something's going to be happening over in ireland michael at your at yeah. the space you're in i'm very certain of that well iceland riceland there you go. Yes, Iceland and Iceland. So, Roger, just I'm going to quickly say too that all the links that you've shared today, and um, you know, with all the presenters that you've brought to the table and the work that you're doing yourself, we will make sure that all that information is on our Facebook page, okay. the retreat, so that um, you know, just to follow up from the whole webinar series because people have really, really been so incredibly happy to have joined it um for this six weeks so we'll follow up on our end with everything that you've been talking about so great cool and that's a good night for me and thank you to everybody yeah. out there joined right. in it's been really nice Bye. getting to know you so i'm okay. gonna miss you Likewise, all everybody yeah. thank thanks, you roger thanks michael and henrietta have a good night and uh, we'll see you again soon um yeah. till the next till the next series right absolutely yeah let, let's do it soon, like after the summer, Roger, when you're back. <laughs> We're yeah. ready. All right. Okay. Good night, all. Good night, Take care. We'll keep in touch on the Facebook page where we can continue mm. the conversation, Jeremy. So, good day, good evening, and good night. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, you better get to bed. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. <laughs> okay.